Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear students. Hope everything is going well with you and welcome back to our new session of Introduction to Linguistics. Today, inshallah, we are going to talk about and tackle a new topic, which is semantics. Um, semantics as a concept. Uh, so the first thing here we have is what is semantics and actually I'd like to shed light on the outline. We have um, some important topics to be covered for this class. We have uh, semantics, conventional versus non-conventional meaning, conceptual and associative meaning, semantic features, semantic roles, agent and theme, instrument and experiencer, location, source, and goal, lexical relations, synonymy, antonymy, hyponymy, prototypes, homophones and homonyms, polysemy, collocation. Okay, so let's go, uh, I mean, to see one by one. Uh, what is semantics? Semantics is the study of meanings of words, phrases, and sentences. Semantics is the study of the conventional literal, dictionary, linguistic, the generally shared objective meaning conveyed by the use of words, phrases, and sentences of a language. So when we are talking about semantics here, we are talking about the meaning conveyed by the use of words. Which type of meaning? It's the literal meaning, it's the dictionary meaning, it's the linguistic meaning, it's the generally shared or the objective meaning, not the subjective one. Okay, in semantic analysis, there is always an attempt to focus on what the words conventionally mean, rather than what a speaker might want the words to mean on a particular occasion. Okay, so what's the difference here? What's the difference if we are talking about what a specific, for example, a speaker might want the words to mean on a particular occasion, then we are talking about pragmatics. We are talking about pragmatics, but semantics focuses on what? On what the words conventionally mean, okay? I mean, depending on the common knowledge of people. Okay, what is semantics again? Conventional versus non-conventional meaning. Uh, we have here linguistic and literal meaning versus speaker's meaning. Conventional means the linguistic and literal meaning, the literal meaning conveyed by the words and the phrases, okay? But non-conventional meaning, it's the speaker's meaning or the meaning the speaker wants or wants to convey, okay? We have intention independence versus intention dependence. Conventional means intention independence. It means the meaning is not dependent on the intention of the speaker, it means it is independent, okay? It is independent, so the intention is independent. Versus intention dependence, it means the meaning is dependent on the intention of the speaker. Okay, literal versus non-literal meaning. Literal versus non-literal meaning. Okay, objective versus subjective. Conventional, objective. Non-conventional, subjective. Subjective means depending on the person. It is personal, depending on the uh, person's point of view or the meaning a person wants. Conceptual and associative meaning. Conceptual and associative meaning. Words have conceptual and associative meaning. In semantics, we deal with conceptual meaning, not associative meaning. When we talk about conceptual, it is the same as conventional. It is the same as conventional, okay? Okay. Uh, conceptual meaning covers those basic components of a meaning conveyed by the literal use of a word. It is, I mean, the meaning conveyed by the literal use of a word. It is the denotation. What a word denotes. It is called denotation. For example, some of the basic components of a word like needle in English might include thin, sharp, steel, instrument, okay? A bird, I mean, depending on the conceptual meaning, a bird is a warm-blooded creature with feather and two wings that can fly. So this is the conceptual meaning. 
It is the dictionary meaning. It is the literal meaning of a word. Okay, it is the denotation. What a word denotes in the real world. Okay, what a word denotes or refers to. What a word, what a word refers to in the real world. That's why it is called denotation. However, connotation, connotation is something else. Okay, it is connotation is the associative meaning, the meaning which is associated with it, which is connected to, I mean, the basic meaning. Okay, let's move to uh, associative meaning. Associative meaning covers associative connotations. As the name implies, or as the word implies, it is connected meaning. It's the connected meaning. It's additional or shade meaning. It's the additional or shade meaning. It's connected meaning related to a word. These associations differ from a person to another. In associative meaning, you may have associations or connotations attached to a word. For example, like a needle which lead you to think of painful or drugs. Another may think of blood or thread. Okay, so it is not the same. It is different from one person into another. Okay, this association is not treated as a conceptual meaning of a needle. Okay, conceptual meaning, needle, thin, sharp, steel. This is conceptual. Needle, it means thin, sharp, steel, instrument. Okay, low calorie producing a small amount of heat or energy. So this is common for everybody. The conceptual meaning is common for everybody. Okay? So it is the literal meaning of words. It is the dictionary meaning. It is the meaning that is common or shared among people. Okay? However, associative meaning, it is the meaning that is associated or it is the shade meaning which is personal. It is different from one person into another. For example, when we talk about love, for example, when we talk about love, it differs or the shade meaning or the associative meaning is different from one person into another. For those who have passed through successful love uh, stories or love, uh, I mean, experiences, love is something good. It's positive for them. However, for those who have passed through or, or who have experienced, I mean, uh, uh, let me say uh, uh, a bad, let me say bad experiences of love, okay, or failed in their experiences of love. I mean, the associative meaning of love to them is a negative one, okay. So, needle, as for associative meaning, needle, pain, illness, blood, drugs, thread, netting. Hard to find. So different, different connotations. We have different connotations. Okay, we have different connotations. This is associative meaning. Low calorie might mean healthy. Okay, might mean healthy. Okay. So associative meaning is not the same, is not the same for different people. Okay, good. Uh, semantic features, semantic features. How does semantic approach help us understand the nature of language? Okay, how does semantic approach help us understand the nature of language? It might be helpful as a means of accounting for the oddness which we experience when we read English sentences such as the following. The hamburger ate the boy the table listens to the radio, the horse is reading the newspaper. So these are different examples which have something in common, which is oddness. They are odd. They are odd. So let's have a look on how these sentences are going to help us understand, I mean, semantic features. Okay. So we are going to consider these examples again. The hamburger and the boy. The table listens to the radio. The horse is reading the newspaper. My cat started linguistics. The oddness of these sentences doesn't derive from their syntactic structure. Okay? They are syntactically right, but semantically odd or strange. So they are odd not because their syntactic structure is wrong. No, syntactically speaking, syntactically speaking, 
Again, syntactically speaking, all these sentences are right. They are well-formed. They are correct because they start with subject. Okay, they start with subjects, known phrases. Then we have verbs. Then we have objects or other known phrases. So subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object. So syntactically speaking, they are okay. They are acceptable. They are well-formed. However, semantically speaking, they are not. They are not okay. They are odd. They are strange. So the oddness of these sentences doesn't come from or derive from their syntactic structure. They are syntactically right, but semantically odd. According to the basic syntactic rules for forming English sentences, we have well-formed structures. These are well-formed. According to what? To the basic syntactic rules of English language. Okay? We have known a phrase, verb, known a phrase. The hamburger ate the boy. Subject, verb. But what is strange here? It's the meaning. It's, it's in, in terms of semantics. The sentence, okay, this sentence is syntactically good, but semantically odd. It's semantically odd or strange. Okay? Odd or strange. Since the sentence, the boy ate the hamburger, is perfectly acceptable. It is the boy ate the hamburger. It is perfectly acceptable. Okay? It is perfectly acceptable. We may be able to identify the source of the problem. So now we are going to go into the source of the problem. The components of the conceptual meaning of the noun hamburger must be significantly different from those of the noun boy. So we have here two nouns, hamburger and boy. Each one has components. Okay, these are called components of the conceptual meaning. Components, الخصائص. الخصائص اللغوية للكلمة. Okay, components of the conceptual, the real, the conceptual meaning. Okay, the conceptual meaning. What are the components of the hamburger? And what are the components of the conceptual meaning of the boy? Let's have a look. Okay, so each noun has some components of conceptual meaning. Okay, the kind of noun that can be the subject of the verb eight must denote an entity that is capable of eating. Okay? Okay, so the subject to be used, okay, or the noun to be used as a subject for the verb eight, okay, must have an entity that is capable of eating. The noun hamburger doesn't have this property, but the noun boy does. So the noun boy has some entities that make it okay, that make it capable of eating. However, in terms of the word hamburger, it doesn't have, okay, any entity that is capable of eating. So the boy is the most appropriate word to be used as the subject of the sentence. Okay? We must find a way to determine which noun would be sufficient to serve as a subject for the verb eight, okay? And that's why we have to look into the semantic features, okay? Again, we must find a way to determine which noun would be sufficient or appropriate to serve or to be used as the subject for the verb eight, okay? We must then go into the semantic features, okay? We use what we call semantic features. Okay, semantic features of words, of nouns, of, okay? Like boy, animate, human, adult. It's, you see, plus. So animate it is animate. Human, because it is plus, so it is a human. If it is minus, it means it is not. Okay? So boy, it's animate, human, and adult. Hamburger, it's not animate, a minus. Human, not human, and not adult even. Okay? Semantic features or elements for these words, okay, boy, hamburger, for any word, okay, for any syntactic structure. Uh, semantic features or elements can be used as basic elements involved in differentiating a word in a language from every other word. So what differentiates a word from another word is the semantic features or elements. Okay, is the semantic features or elements.
Okay, let's have a look here. The space is reading a newspaper. So we need here a subject, a noun to be used as a subject for the verb is reading. So what are the semantic features for the noun to be used here? Okay, again, what are the semantic features or elements for the noun which is to be used here as the subject for the verb is reading? Okay, it should be a noun, animate and human. Why? Because it must have an entity which makes it capable of reading. Okay, which makes it capable of reading. So the noun, the man, the student, the boy, the girl, okay? It must be animate and human because the verb is reading. So the semantic features of the noun to be used here as the subject of the verb is reading must have the entity which makes it capable of reading. It must be an animate, okay? Animate and a human. These are the semantic features or elements, okay, for words. These semantic features, okay, can help us differentiate a word from another. Okay, so analyzing meaning in terms of syntactic features. Analyzing meaning in terms of syntactic features, okay? So let's have a look on the syntactic features of these words, table, horse, boy, man, girl, woman, okay? so. We are going to analyze the meaning of these words in terms of what? In terms of their syntactic features. What are the syntactic features which are we going to look for? Animate, human, female, adult. Table, it's minus, 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 minus. It means it's not animate, it's not a human, it's not female, it's not adult. Horse, it is animate. A living thing, animate means a living thing. Okay, animate. It's not a human, it's not female, it is an adult horse, okay? Boy, boy, an animate, okay? Human, but it's not female, it's not an adult. Man, animate, human, not female, of course, it is an adult. Girl, okay? Okay, it is animate, human, female, not adult. And woman, animate, human, female, and an adult, okay? Semantic role. Semantic roles. Okay. Instead of thinking of words as containers of meaning, we can look at the roles they perform within a sentence. So from now on, we are going to look for the roles words have in sentences. Okay. So now we are going to deal with words as having roles in sentences. What is the role of this or that word? Okay, now the phrases describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. Again, now the phrases describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. For example, the boy kicked the ball. The boy kicked the ball. Okay, verb kicked. We have here kicked. It is the verb. It describes the action. It describes the action. However, we have two noun phrases. We have the boy and the ball. So we're talking about noun phrases. Noun phrases describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. Why? Because the verb is the action and we have the boy and the ball are two noun phrases that are involved in the action. Involved in the action in one way or another. Okay, noun phrase the boy and the ball describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. Like the boy, people. The ball, things. Both of them are involved in the action. The boy is the agent, is the doer, okay? Is the one who makes the action. The ball is the one which receives the action, okay? And it is, okay, it is another noun phrase. So noun phrases describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. We have verb kicked. Okay, it describes the action itself. We have noun phrases. We have the boy and the boar. Both describe the roles of entities such as people and things involved in the action. We can identify a small number of semantic roles. 
These semantic rules are also called thematic rules for those noun phrases. Okay? Thematic rules. So we are going to talk about noun phrases from now on. Noun phrases, whether they are subjects or objects, okay? Not verbs, of course. Okay, noun phrases. Noun phrases, whether are they are here at the beginning or after the verb. Okay, so we can identify identify a small number of semantic roles. What are the semantic roles or the thematic roles of noun phrases that occur in sentences? Let's have a look about the uh, uh, semantic roles. We have different semantic roles. We have agent and theme, instrument and experiencer, location, source, and goal. Again, agent and theme. Instrument and experiencer, location, source, and goal. Okay, agent and theme. The agent, it's the entity that performs the action. Again, the entity that performs the action. For example, the boy kicked the ball. Okay, the boy, noun a phrase. An entity, we are talking about noun phrases, by the way. So, the boy, an entity that performs the action. Who performs the action? The boy. Okay. As in the example sentence, one role is taken by the boy as the entity that performs the action, so it is the agent. So the noun of the, the, the role, okay, the semantic role, the semantic role of the boy is agent here, okay? The semantic role, we are talking about semantic roles, okay? So and as in the example sentence, one role is taken by the boy as the entity that performs the action. So it is the agent. Although agents, so it's I, I think it's clear cut. Although agents are typically human, typically, they are typically, okay, in most cases, they are typically human, they can also be non-human forces, machines, or creatures. For example, the wind blew the ball away, the car ran over the ball, the dog caught the ball. So we have the wind, the car, the dog. All of them are agents they are agents but none of them okay none of them are human okay none of, none of them is a human sorry none of them is a human okay so but some agents okay some agents are human some others are not good theme the entity that is involved in or affected by the action is known as the theme. The entity that is involved in or affected by the action is known as the theme, affected by the action. So, okay, so it is the one that receives the action. For example, the boy kicked the ball. The boy kicked the ball. In this sentence, the ball is the theme or sometimes the patient because it is affected by the action performed by the agent, okay? The agent is the boy. The theme is the ball because the, the, the agent performed the action, okay? And the theme received the action or we can say is affected by the action. And that's why it is sometimes called the patient, okay? It is sometimes called the patient. So it is affected by the action performed by the agent. It receives the action. The theme can also be an entity, the ball, that is simply being described. That is simply being described, okay? Not performing an action, as in the ball was red. The ball was red. So again, the theme can be an entity that is simply being described. What is described here? The ball. So here, the ball is what? is the theme, okay? The ball is the theme, not an agent because it is the one that is being described, okay? The theme is typically not a human, but can be human, okay? For example, the boy kicked himself, himself. Here the boy is agent, the boy is agent, and himself is the theme. And as we see here, himself is a human, okay? Typically, typically, themes are not a human, the ball, okay, the car, the chocolate, the bar, blah, 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 blah. But sometimes they can be human, like the boy kicked himself. Himself is the, the theme, which is here 
a human, which is human, okay? The dog chased the boy. The dog chased the boy. The boy is the theme, and the dog is the agent. The theme here is human also. It is a human, okay? Let's move to the other slide. Instrument and experiencer. Instrument and experiencer. If an agent uses another entity in order to perform an action, that other entity fills or takes the role of instrument. Okay, if the agent uses another entity in order to perform an action, that other entity takes the role of instrument. Let's see the example. For example, the boy cut the robe with a razor. The boy is agent. Cut the robe. The robe is the theme. But the boy, which is the agent, okay, uses another entity, which is razor, in order to perform an action. So if the agent, which is the boy, uses another entity, the razor, in order to perform the action, okay, then this entity, the one used by the agent, okay, takes the role of the instrument. So this is his instrument. The, I mean, he drew the picture with a pencil. He drew the picture with a pencil. So this is, or these are called experiencers, okay, experiencer, with a razor, with a pencil, okay, with a hammer, experiencer, okay, experiencer, good. Uh, sorry, instrument. I'm sorry, instrument. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is instrument. This is instrument. The boy cut the rope with a razor. He drew the picture with a pencil. It is an instrument. It is an instrument. Okay, yes, of course, it is an instrument. So the agent uses something else to perform the action. What does he use here? He used a razor. What does he use here? Okay, as a present simple, okay, uh, a pencil. So this is called instrument. Of course, it is an instrument, okay, because this is agent, action, theme. Agent, action, okay, agent, action, drew, picture, theme. With a pencil is the instrument used by the agent. With a razor, the instrument used by the agent. And that's why it's called instrument, okay? It makes sense now. The noun phrases, a razor and a pencil, have the semantic role of instrument. So what is the semantic role of a razor? Razor, it's an instrument. The semantic role of rope or the rope, the noun phrase rope, is a theme. The semantic role of the boy, it's the agent. Okay, this is very easy. Okay, when a noun phrase is used to represent an entity as the person who has a feeling, perception or state, it fills the role of experiencer. Of course, again, when a noun phrase is used to represent an entity as the person who has a feeling, perception, a state, it fills the role or it takes the role of experiencer. If we see, know, or enjoy something, we are not really performing an action. Of course, we are not performing an action. So we are not agents. In this way, we are in the role of experiencer. In the role of experiencer. Because he experienced something. For example, in the boy feels sad. The boy feels sad. Now the boy feels. The boy doesn't hear. The boy feels sad. The boy doesn't perform any action. He just feels something. So he experienced something. Okay? And that's why the boy here, if we have verbs like feels, uh, sees, okay? Uh, I mean, hears, smells, and I mean, these types of verbs, okay? We call this, I mean, the noun phrase, the boy, experiencer, okay? For example, the boy feels sad. In the boy feels sad, the experiencer, the boy, is the only semantic role in the sentence. So what is the semantic role of the boy here? Okay? It is experiencer, because... The noun phrase, the boy, doesn't perform any action. And instead, it's just, okay, it just experiences something, okay? It feels, it sees, it smells, okay? The boy feels sad. And this is tough. 
Okay. Did you hear that noise? Did you hear that noise? You hear that noise. So you is the experiencer. Okay. The experiencer is you. And the theme is that noise. The theme is that noise. It's easy. Next. Location, source, and goal. Location, source, and goal. Location. Other semantic roles, location represents where an entity is. It's the location, like on the table, in the room, on the wall, in the market, okay, in the kitchen, okay, behind the tree, next to the table, okay, this is stuff. Mary saw a mosquito on the wall, okay, in this sentence, on the wall is location. So what is the semantic role of on the wall? It's location. Where an entity moves from is the source. And where it moves to is the goal. Again, where an entity moves from is the source. And where it moves to is the goal. Like when we say, for example, we traveled from London to New York. We travel from London to New York. From London is the source. And to New York is the goal. So what is the semantic role of from London? It is the source. What is the semantic role of to New York? It is the goal. So we have, so far, we have talked about almost seven or eight semantic roles. Okay. Let's go to lexical relations. Uh, introduction, lexical relations. Lexical relations characterize words in terms of their relations with other words. Lexical relations, so the relationship between lexes, between words. This is the, the idea of lexical relations, the relationship between words. Okay, so lexical relations characterize words in terms of their relations with each other or with one another. Words are not only the containers of meaning, they can also have relationships. We describe the meanings of words in terms of their relationships. For example, again, we describe the meanings of words in terms of their relationships to each other or of one another. For example, if we ask the meaning of a word conceal, we might reply it is the same as hide. So we have given a synonym. Conceal, it is the same as, you see. So we have given the meaning of conceal Okay, in terms of what? In terms of its relation to another word. Conceal, it is the same as hide. The meaning of shallow as the opposite of deep. It is the opposite of deep. So we have given the meaning of shallow, okay, in terms of its relation to another word, deep. Okay, the meaning of daffodil as it is a kind of flower. It's a kind of flower. So we have given the meaning of one word, okay, depending on its, on in what? On its relation to another word. Good. In doing so, we are characterizing the meaning of a word, not in terms of component features, but in terms of relationship to other words. Again, so we are characterizing meaning of a word or words, not in terms of component features, but in terms of the relationship to other words, okay? We have different types of lexical relations. Lexical relations are synonymy, antonymy, hyponymy, prototypes, homophones and homonyms, and polysemy, and polysemy, okay, or polysemy. Next, let's see one by one. Synonymy, this is synonymy, Synonyms are two or more words with very closely related meanings. Again, synonyms are two or more words with very closely related meanings. This is clear cut. They can often, though not always, be substituted for each other in sentences. Okay? We can use one instead of another or in position of another one, in the place of the other. Okay? Okay, so answer, reply, cab, taxi, liberty, freedom. Okay, so synonyms are two words or more with very closely related meanings that cannot always be substituted for one another. Antonyms, opposites, of course. Antonyms are two forms or words with opposite meanings. 
quick, slow, big, small, long, short, rich, poor, happy, sad, hot, cold, old, young, male, female, true, false, alive, dead. Okay? Antonymy. Antonyms are divided into two parts. Antonyms are divided into two parts. We have gradable, gradable antonyms and non-gradable antonyms. Okay? Uh, we have some characteristics for them. Let's talk about gradable antonyms. First of all, they represent points on the scale. And when we say they represent points on the scale, we mean that uh, they indicate they indicate something on a specific scale. That's to say, for example, hot and cold indicate the opposite position on a temperature scale. We have hot, we have cold. And there are some possibilities between them. When we say represent points on a scale, it means they can be put on a scale and some other possibilities can be inserted between them. Like warm, it can be used between hot and cold. Okay, mild can be used between hot and cold on the scale. Okay, and that's why hot and cold indicate the opposite position on a temperature scale. This is, they represent points on a scale. Okay, they represent points on a scale. Okay, one point, two point, and in between we have different, different grades. Okay, different grades, and that's why they are called gradable. They represent points on a scale. This is point, hot, we have warm, we have mild, we have cold, and we have different degrees. This is what we mean by represent points on the scale, okay? They can be qualified or modified by adverbs, such as very, quite, extremely, okay? For example, the tickets were surprisingly expensive. The tickets were very expensive. The tickets were quite expensive, so they can be modified by adverbs. This is number two. Number three, they can be used in comparative and superlative constructions. Like what? Hot, hotter, hottest, or the hottest, okay? Big, bigger, the biggest, and this is tough. They can be used in comparative and superlative constructions. Other gradable pairs include tall, short, wide, narrow, big, small, strong, weak, heavy, light. High, low, okay? Number four, negative of one member of the gradable pair doesn't necessarily imply or mean the other, okay? The negative of one member of one pair, let me say, of a gradable pair does not necessarily or imply the other. For example, if the dog is not old, it doesn't necessarily mean the dog is young. If somebody isn't weak, it doesn't mean he is a strong, okay? So the absence of one member of the gradable pair doesn't necessarily mean the other. So we have so far talked about four characteristics of gradable antonyms. Let's move to non-gradable antonyms. Non-gradable antonyms, also called complementary pairs or binary antonyms. Complementary pairs or binary antonyms, these are direct opposites. Direct opposites, nothing in between. They represent opposed states that cannot be measured, that cannot be measured on a scale. That's to say, they do not admit any possibilities between them. Okay, again, they are binary antonyms, they are complementary pairs, they are direct opposites, they represent opposed states that cannot be measured on a scale. What do we mean by cannot be measured on a scale? It means they do not admit any possibilities between them. For example, if we say uh, alive and dead, okay, we cannot say alive, dead, and we have something in between, different degrees for alive and dead. And that's why they are direct opposites that cannot be represented on a scale. They do not admit any possibilities between them. Okay? Did. Alive. Did. 
alive. Nothing in between can be inserted or be used, okay? Nothing in between can be used. Good. Okay, so they do not admit any possibilities between them. Okay, the denial or negative of one means the assertion or the presence of the other. Okay, the negative or denial of one of them or, or one of the pairs, okay, or one member of the pairs means the presence or assertion of the other. Thus, if one isn't male, it is certainly a female. Okay, if one isn't alive, he is certainly dead. Okay, so the negative of one member of the pairs means the assertion or the presence of the other. Non-agreeable antonyms can't be used in comparative constructions or superlative. For example, we cannot say John is didier, okay, did, alive. <laughs> Cannot. John is didier than Tom. Or he was more alive than I was. Cannot be used. Okay? Okay? No, it can't be used. Or they can't be used in this sense. Okay? Cannot be used. non agreeable antonyms can't be used in comparative constructions. Next. They don't allow adverbs like very to qualify them. Okay, very dead, very alive. No, okay. Non agreeable antonyms are complementary in that the negation of one is the meaning of the other. So they complete each other in this sense. Complementary, complete each other. If one is absent, okay, if, if, if one is absent, it means the presence of the other, okay. For example, not dead means alive. So they complete each other, complementary. Not a true means false, and so on. Okay? So, complementary in this sense means the absence or the negation of one means the presence of another. Means the presence or the meaning of the other one. Right? They complete each other. They complete each other. If he is not dead, he is alive. Okay? Male, female. North, south. Single, married, before, after, present, absent, awake, asleep, etc. Hyponymy. Hyponymy, when the meaning of a word is included in the meaning of another, the relationship is described as hyponymy. Okay, so one meaning is included in another. One is more general and one is more specific. One is general and one is more specific. So the meaning of a word is included in the meaning of another. The relationship here is called hyponymy. Hyponyms are words whose meaning are whose meanings are specific instances of a more general word. For example, red, blue, yellow are hyponyms of the word color. They are hyponyms, red, blue, white, black are hyponyms of the word color. Okay, inclusion. Hyponyms okay, or hyponymy means inclusion. Hyponymy is sometimes referred to as inclusion. Yes, because one is included in another. The meaning of one word is included in the other. Okay? Hyponymy is sometimes referred to as inclusion. The meaning of a more specific word is included in that of another more general word. Okay? Clear cut. For example, if an object is a rose, then it is necessarily a flower. So the meaning of a rose is included in the meaning of a flower. The relationship of hyponymy captures the concept of is a kind of, is a kind of, okay? As when we give the meaning of a word by saying rose is a kind of flower, blue is a kind of color, oak is a kind of tree, or so is a kind of pig, okay? So it captures the concept or the meaning of it's a kind of. It's a kind of the same. So one meaning is included in another meaning. And that's why it is called inclusion. Hyponymy, we have subordinate and superordinate. Subordinate and superordinate. Daffodil, 
and rose. Again, daffodil and rose are hypenems of a flower. And lion and elephant are hypenems of animal. The general words flower and animal are the superordinate terms. Superordinate. Okay? Superordinate. And the more specific ones, daffodil, rose, lion, and elephant, are the subordinate terms. So we have superordinate, the more general, and superordinate, the more general, and subordinate, the more specific. Okay? Good. This is easy. We look at the meaning of words in some type of hierarchical relationship, like tree diagram. Living things, okay? Creature. Okay, so these are living things like creatures and plants are superordinate, superordinate. But here, cabbage, rose, pine are subordinate, okay? Living things divided into two parts, creature, plant, or plant, creature, animal, insect, animal, horse, dog, pig, horse, mare, dog, uh, hound, pig, swine, insect, cro croach, okay? Living things, also we have plants, vegetable, flowers, trees. We have cabbage, rose, and pine. Okay? So, uh, like tree diagram. Hierarchical relationship. Good. So, in hyponyms, we have subordinate and superordinate. Okay, hyponyms, subordinate and superordinate. Kala is a superordinate term. But uh, blue, red, yellow are subordinates. Okay? Subordinate. These are hyponyms. Okay? Subordinate and superordinate. Hyponyms, subordinate and superordinate. Hyponymous sets also include things like hammer, saw, screwdriver, spanner, etc. Under the general word tool. Okay? So all these are listed under tools. Okay? So, minshar, screwdriver spanner etc under the general word tool okay uh, place cod herring saw under the general word fish these are types of fish okay okay kinds of fish okay so uh cumber we have general superordinate hyponym and specific subordinate cool hyponym cool okay Okay, cool. Okay, so we have general superordinate hyponym like flower, animal, material. Okay, so these are general superordinate hyponyms. And we have specific subordinate co hyponym like rose, lily, daffodil, cow, horse, sheep, tiger, solid, gas, liquid. Okay, rose, lily, daffodil together. Cow, horse, sheep, tiger together. Solid, gas, liquid, together. So they are specific, subordinate, co-hyponym. Okay. Uh, next, we have prototypes. Prototype, mudaj, or namudaj, is the most characteristic instance of a category. Afda ma fasila. Okay, so prototype, prototypes. Prototype is the most characteristic instance of a category. While the words canary, cormorant, dove, duck, flamingo, parrot, pelican, and robin are all equally cool hyphens of the superordinate bird, they are not all considered to be equally good examples of the category bird. Okay? They are not equally representatives. Again, they are not equally representatives of the superordinate bird. We cannot use all of them as prototypes for birds. Okay? Next. According to some researchers, the most characteristic instance of the category bird is robin. This is Robin. This is Robin. Okay? The concept of a prototype helps explain the meaning of certain words like bird, 
not in terms of the component features, like has feathers, has wings, never. Why? For example, an ostrich cannot be used to represent or to be used as a prototype for birds. So we do not depend on the component features. If we talk about the component features, an ostrich, this is an ostrich, has feathers. It has wings. Okay, it is a bird, but it is an or it cannot be used to represent birds. So it is not used or it cannot be used. It is not the most appropriate creature to be used as a prototype. Laysa afdal man yumathil. Okay, so we do not depend on the component features, al khasa'is, like it has feathers, it has wings. Okay, all of these. Okay, but in terms of what? What do we depend on actually? What do we depend on is in terms of resemblance to the clearest example. Clearest example. In terms of what? In terms of the resemblance to the clearest example. Okay? So to what extent does a robin, for example, resemble the clearest example of birds? To what extent? Again, to what extent does a robin resemble the clearest example of birds? We can say to a great extent. To a great extent. Okay? So we depend on what? On the resemblance of the object. Resemblance of the thing to the clearest example. Okay, we do not depend on the component features. Okay, next, given the category label furniture, we are quick to recognize chair as a better example than bench or a stool. Given clothing, people recognize shirts quicker than shoes. And given vegetable, they accept carrot before potato or tomato. So it's clear that there is some general pattern to the recognition process involved in prototypes. So again, again, a prototype is the most characteristic instance of a category. Afdal ma yumathil fasil. Prototype, in mudaj. Okay? So in birds, in general, we see a robin as the most appropriate thing or as a most the most appropriate creature to represent birds okay we cannot say for example a flamingo this is the flamingo we cannot say a flamingo even though if we want to depend on the component features on the component features okay a flamingo has feathers okay it has two wings, so it is a bird, but it cannot be used as a prototype for birds, okay? So what do we depend on? What do we depend on? We depend on the resemblance of the object or of the creature to the clearest example. Clear, the clearest example. What is the clearest example? It is, does it? resemble the clearest example of birds it is robin okay it is robin okay homophones and homonyms homophones and homonyms when two or more different written forms i mean words have the same pronunciation they are described as homophones why because homo means the same phones means sounds so the same sounds so again when two or more different written forms have the same pronunciation they are described as homophones like burr burr meat meat flower flower pale pale male male okay two different words different two different words okay they have the same pronunciation homophones they have the same 
sounds, okay? Homo means the same and phone means sound, okay? But they are different. So this is done, we are done with homophones, cut clear. Let's go to homonyms. When we use, uh, we use the term homo homonyms when one or the same form written or spoken has two or more unrelated or different meanings, okay? The same written form, the same written form, the same word, the same word has two different or unrelated meanings. They share the same spelling and the same pronunciation, but have different meanings. Like bank, for example. Bank of a river. Bank means financial institution. Pupil at school, a student. Pupil of the eye. Okay? Okay, homonyms. Easy. Polysemy. Two words or more with the same form and related meanings. Again, two words or more with the same form and related meanings. Polysemy can be defined as one form, written or spoken. One form. Having multiple meanings that are all related by extension. That are all related by extension. Okay? So the same form. For example, head. The object on top of your body the object so it must be on top of something head is the object on top of your body like I mean, your head which and which you can have your eyes ears nose okay head head the person at the top of a company or department so at the top of something okay and that's why it is we, we can see here all related by extension so it is the same word Polysemy can be defined as one form, one word, written or spoken, having multiple meanings that are all related by extension, okay? A mouth, meaning either the opening on one's face or the opening of a cave or a river. It's opening, opening, okay? This is what we mean by extension, related by extension. So this is polysemy. This is polysemy. Next. Metonymy, metonymy, okay, lexical relation, metonymy. In metonymy, a thing or concept is not called by its own name, but by the name of something intimately associated with that thing or concept. Again, okay, in metonymy, we do not call a thing by its own name, rather by something associated intimately associated with it, closely associated with it. Let's have a look. The connection between the words can be based on what? On a container content relation, like bottle, water, can, juice, container content, okay? Bottle, container, water, content, uh, can, container, juice, content, okay? Or a whole part relation, like whole and part, Car, whole. Wheels, part. Okay, next. House, roof. House is whole and roof is part. And last but not least, we have a representative simple relationship. So these are the relationships. A representative simple relationship. Like what? King, the representative, crown, the simple. Okay? President, White House. President is the representative. And the White House is the simple, okay? So metonymy, we call something not by its name, however, or by, by something intimately associated with it or closely related with it. Next, metonymy, okay? It is our familiarity with metonymy that makes it possible for us to understand he drank the whole bottle. Although it sounds absurd, literally. That's to say he drank the liquid, not the glass object. So when we say he drank the whole bottle, we don't mean he drank the glass object, the object. No, he drank the liquid inside the bottle. Okay, so we say he drank the whole bottle. This is metonymy. So we call something not by its name, but by what? By something related to it, closely associated with it. And the relation is here three types. Okay, we have so far talked about three types of relation. So our familiarity with metonymy makes 
it very possible for us to understand the meaning of sentences. Okay? He drank the whole bottle. Okay? So we mean he drank the liquid, not the glass object. We also accept the White House has announced. Okay? The White House, no, the people inside our house has announced. Okay? The people inside the White House have announced blah, blah, blah. But we say the White, the White House has announced. Okay? Or Downing Street protested. We mean the people. Not Downing Street. Downing Street, we talk about buildings. But the people of Downing Street, the residents of Downing Street, okay? Downing Street protested, okay? So we understand this sentence, Downing Street protested, without being puzzled that buildings appear to be talking and protesting, okay? We use metonymy when we talk about filling up the car, okay? Of course, we uh, fill up the tank of the car, answering the door, boiling a kettle, giving someone a hand, or kneading some wheels. Okay, so all these are used or are called metonymy. Okay, making sense of such expressions often depends on context, background knowledge, and inference. Okay, context, background knowledge, of course. So we have to depend on context, background knowledge, and inference. Okay, in order to understand these sentences. Next. So, context, background knowledge, and inferences. Collocation, very easy, of course. Collocation is defined as a sequence of words or terms that often co occur or appear together. Co occur or appear together. A collocation is made up of two or more words that are commonly used together. Another definition, okay? Good collocation examples of this type of word pairing are combinations with make and do. We have many, many collocation words, okay? So words collocate, okay? Words always collocate. A good example for word pairing or collocation is the combination with make and do. For example, you make a cup of tea, but you do your homework. You do your homework, okay? We have a good example here of money. Money, save money, earn money, spend money, invest money, waste money, make money. Make, make a difference, make a friend, make a fortune, make a noise, make a phone call, make a decision, make a mistake. Okay, so these are good examples of collocation. Next. Okay, I think we have come to the end of our class. Collocation, which words tend to occur with other words? We have hammer, table, thread. Uh, pepper, nail, chair, butter, bread, needle, salt, break, roll, promise, heat. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me. And until we meet again, inshallah, in the next class, all the best and bye-bye.